community being built here at, uh, in Lewis Center. Evans Farm is a community that's built on the principles of new urbanism, and, and the idea here is to take all the great things from uh, the communities that are the most desirable communities in, in our market and other markets where people have front porches and they get to know their neighbors and they walk to the services and the amenities that they use every day, uh, and those are the kind of things, that the principles that we're trying to instill at, at, at our community. Uh, one of the things that really makes us unique and one of the things that is consistent in some of the more desirable communities in town is great design. And that goes from the layout of the community and the design of the actual um, streets and all of that, as well the design of the homes. We've got an illustrious panel of experts up here tonight uh, that you'll hear from. Uh, they will talk about a variety of topics that we think will, will, you'll find interesting. But one of the unique things about Evans Farm is that Buyers are going to control their lot, and through that process, they're going to design a home, and they're going to pick a lot, and they're going to build a house, and it's something that a lot of people have never done, uh, and don't necessarily understand how to go about that. You, you finance the lot, you finance the, the whole house, you have to pay cash for the lot, how fast uh, do I have to get started on my, my building plans, so I have enough time to, to get the plans done, and then get the house built, and move in on the, the schedule I want to, and, and how do I figure out when to put my house on the market, do I have to move twice, or can I do some other uh, sort of uh, single move and get lucky and maybe time that just right. So hopefully we'll go through some of that and some other interesting things. Hopefully you all got one of these little books. If you didn't, they're out on the table and we can pass more out. Really, um, the outline is not the same here as, as you'll see, but lots of space in here to take notes. You're welcome to keep these with you. If you have questions, please ask them uh, at the end. Uh, write your questions down as we're going, uh, and then we'll ask them all at the end, and everybody up here will be, will be happy to stick around. We're hoping to get this in within an hour, so we've asked everybody to keep their, their time in three or four minutes. Um, but again, lots of really good information that we, we think you'll find uh, helpful. Restrooms are out to the right, down around the hall, kind of down around the corner if anybody needs that. Uh, and again, we're uh, appreciative of you being here. We are taking lot reservations in Evans Farm now in phase one, and we anticipate having streets in the spring. So we're gonna transfer lots and, and title in the springtime uh, as we work on underground utilities now, get to the paving in, in uh, April or May or whatever we can get to that weather for me. So for people that are uh, anxious about what's gonna start happening above ground, next summer will be a really exciting time because we'll have residential and commercial things happening all at the same time next year. So that's the Evans Farm sales pitch, and uh, I'd like to get started with our discussion. We talked about good design. Uh, Sandra LaFontaine is the architect that will be handling the architecture review process. She's going to talk about that briefly. Sandra's done a couple of projects like this before, most recently one in Memphis. Uh, there was a similar kind of community to, uh, to Evans Farm. So please welcome Sandra LaFontaine.
and all that's going on. There's a very basic set of prints, which we call a builder level set of prints, which essentially have all the information that's needed for the permit and a few additional points, details, and the, the important details that we need to convey how they should be built for the property. Um, but there's an intermediate set, which is a little bit more detailed, and then there's a full custom set, which I've done, which can end up in sheets. So to me, I think the successful design process is the one that hopefully tries to simplify all of that, or at least make it a more efficient process. Uh, and different builders handle that process differently. Um, your job, if you will, is really to kind of come in with as much information as you can about what you desire. What are you looking for? What is my house? What's the size of my house going to be? What's my budget? I mean, the budget, of course, is probably the first and most important part of the equation. I'd love to tell you all builders figure out their pricing the same way they don't. 
point. And so that's going to be on you to try and then understand how do they arrive at their, at their pricing. Is it a cost per square foot? Uh, is it based on you know, a, a particular model they build? Um, many builders do have seven, eight, nine, ten models that they generally like and have built enough and are familiar with enough that they may encourage you to say, hey, I, I like this one. Is this close to what you want? Can we massage this a little bit? As you can imagine, working with something that has been done before is exponentially easier for a custom home builder. If we have to start with nothing, and believe me, as a guy who designs for a living, I love that, sure, I love to start from scratch. But you know, that becomes a much more cumbersome process, right? There's a lot more involved in designing something from nothing. And so I encourage you, when you go in and interview builders, and when you eventually sit down with them to talk about your house, to bring with you, presumably, you know, there's. You know, the wonderful thing about the internet is it has now opened up a thousand sources for you to find at least inspiration. <clears throat> I've been doing this long enough now, they actually got started before the internet existed, which I'm embarrassed to say. But at the end of the day, people used to just bring me books and say, hey, Brad, I'd like this. And it seemed to me it was my job to take the 10 books that they brought in and understand which thing they liked from each one of those pictures and bring them together into a house that they wanted. So the trick with doing that with a builder, of course, is that a builder is going to also say, hey, Brad, be smart. Be smart about the budget. You know, uh, there was once a time when I just kind of went off on my own and designed what I wanted to. But a budget, of course, now is also a critical part of that equation. And working with a builder, that, of course, is part of the discussion quite a bit. So in my view, typically the process is you come in, you meet with me for an hour, usually. We talk a little bit about what size house do you want. And we don't get into the details about what kind of finish you want on your kitchen faucet yet. What I want to hear is, how many rooms are there in your house? How big is this house? Is it 2,000 square feet? Is it 3,000 square feet? If you have the ability to walk through a few models and get to know what does a house that's 3,000 square feet look like? What's it feel like? Is this enough for me and my family? No, I bet we need a little bit more than that. Or now this is too much. But knowing the size of some square footage of homes is tremendously helpful in terms of getting you down the road faster. So we meet for an hour, we talk about, you know, is the master bedroom on the first floor, is it on the second floor? What's your budget? Do you have a dining room anymore? As you probably saw, many of you went to the parade of homes, the dining room is kind of becoming, you know, a dodo bird. Um, some still have, some people still have, you know, dining room furniture they want a home for, but uh, I would say if we design 10 houses now, seven of them do not have a formal dining room anymore. Um, so we meet, you go away for a couple of weeks and I go back to my cave and I design something. And presumably I'm coming back to you in a couple of weeks time, maybe three if we're very busy, which unfortunately we are these days. But I'll come back and I want to be within 80% of what you said, you know, what you're after. You know, I, it won't be exactly the house we'll build, I suppose, but it'll be close enough. I would like to think that now we're going to tweak it a little bit. And after that first tweak, I'm now giving it to someone like Sandra to say, Sandra, what do you think? I beginning to look the way you want it to be, to fit into Evan's farm. Presumably it is, and then I take it for one more week or so, and I make it a set of drawings that we can then start getting real bids from, and we can start proceeding with, uh, with getting permits. But what you should prepare yourself for, it seems to me, is that from the minute you walk into the builder's office to the minute you can put a shovel in the ground and start digging, you know, I can say it's minimally 10 to 12 weeks anyway, right? There's, there's time for Sanders team to review it. There's time for us to design it. There's time for it to be permitted. And permitting in most of the locations in Central Ohio these, these days, it's 30 days. And that's generally if you're doing it right and there aren't corrections that need to be made. So from beginning to end, you come in, you're gone. It's about three months, I would say, uh, when we, we put a shovel on the ground. Um, beyond that, uh, Yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, I encourage you to, 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 to keep in mind that um, there are a thousand things that will be decided between you know, when you start this process and when you're done and when you're moving in. The first meeting is hopefully a lot more general, a lot easier. Um, don't get too bogged down in the details at the beginning. Um, my toughest clients are the ones who come in and say, I don't really know what I want, Brad. Can you start doing something? Bring in some things. My 
best clients are the ones who have at least a few things they can bring in and say, Brad, here's what I have in mind. It gets me that much down the road faster to understand what's in their head. And the, you know, the old adage of a picture tells a thousand words couldn't be more true as it relates to you know, what, what we do for a living. Um, and as I said, the internet has become a wonderful resource. Um, ePlanHouse.com, you've heard of these places. They are wonderful resources for you to bring to your builder and presumably the designer within your builder's office uh, to say, here's you know, where I'd like to go. Anyway, thank you. Brad mentioned that all exciting uh, permits and approvals and all that, Bob Skinner is with uh, Sierra Homes and he's gonna kind of walk you through the, that mm -hmm. mess that is the inspections and the approvals and all the fun things that happen behind the scenes and can sometimes delay the process. But hopefully not with any of these guys, right? Hi, right. right, thanks everybody for uh, coming tonight. Um, again, I'm Bob Skinner, uh, I own uh, Sierra Custom Homes. Um, once, like Brad had mentioned there, all that per, uh, planning and designing aspect that you have, it's obviously time to get your <coughs> permit so you can actually start construction. Uh, one of the first things that you need in order to get your building permit, you're gonna need to obtain the zoning permit. Uh, this phase here is in Orange Township, so it's, it's a relatively easy process for the zoning permit. Um, you'll also be required to get what is called a desk permit. Uh, it's a road and sediment control through the, the county. Those things are required prior to getting the permit. Once you submit the permit to Delaware County, those are things that need to be attached to the to that set of plans. Uh, the approval process can take up to, like I said, 30 days or so to get that through the county. Um, once you have the plans done, there's a lot of other paperwork that the builders will supply. You know, this is something that happens behind the scenes that typically the, the buyers don't get too involved with as far as getting truss drawings, floor joist layouts heating designs, electric designs, there's a large packet of information that is required to get that building permit uh, and get it approved. And if there are hiccups in there, that certainly can delay the process. A lot of these builders here have worked in Delaware County and it's a pretty seamless process that you've you know, got to, to work through. And Delaware County is a, a very professional building department. They have really good inspectors. Um, the process is, is, is done very well through that. Um, some of the things that, um, you know, happen through that process is once you do get the building permit, then you are able to actually dig your foundation. As soon as that excavation starts, one of the first inspections that's going to be required is a footer inspection. And again, the builders will all handle all those inspection process, but there are numerous inspections that happen from the very beginning of the process, from footers to for your foundation inspection, you know, you've got electric, plumbing, heating, you know, it, it's it's quite a bit of inspections. And your house will kind of sit uh, during the process. You might wonder why nothing's happened for the last two or three days. Just keep it going through that inspection process. Those all have to be scheduled, you know, well in advance, typically 24 hours uh, in advance to get those inspections, and get those approved and so forth. Once you kind of get through your, your rough inspection and so forth, after your house is getting close to finish, we go through the process all over again. You get your finished electric, your finished plumbing, your finished uh, heating. Um, and again, the builder will all take care of that. They'll call, they'll schedule it, they'll take care of that. Um, finally, you get an occupancy permit. You're done. You're able to enjoy the house and, and be able to move into it. So. A lot of work goes into the, the permitting and approval process. A lot of it is kind of behind the scenes to where you guys you know, uh, aren't involved in that process too much, but there's a lot involved in, in getting all that stuff taken care of. So, simple, but a, a lot of stuff there too. Thank you. <laughs> sitting here in the front and he's uh, uh, graciously decided to allow Cecil Cotton to talk with you a little bit about indoor air quality which is a, a big topic today and, and the HDAC systems that are going in these new homes. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, 
HVAC is probably the least thought about uh, function of the home until it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you get your base from the furnace that's running, then it's a problem. In building a new home, there's several factors you have to, you have to uh, bring in. Uh, there's different systems that go in houses today, thinking of the air quality, air movement, things like that. The most common is a single furnace, a single air conditioner, and a single thermostat. Pretty basic. But there's a little bit more to it than just that. In designing, especially new homes, you got to think about how much air volume is in the house. And you got to think about circulation. You know, those, those are the type of things uh, that the uh, design will, will figure out for you. But there's going to be not a bad answer for each house. You can't say every house here is going to have a certain size furnace. Um, we typically there's another system called a zone system, which is a single furnace, single air conditioner, but two zones in the house. You heat and cool the, the home, uh, first floor, second floor, you can, you can separate those two temperature-wise. If you have a single furnace now, you probably have an area of the house that's really warm or really cold. This helps you control that a little bit more. Depends on the size of the house. Um, another system called a dual system. Some of the houses today don't have to where you need two furnaces one upstairs in the attic or in the basement or one on the second floor in the closet somewhere. Those will all be brought, uh, brought up to you in order to decide what is best for your house. We don't decide our heating contractors will do load calculations. They will say this is how much, how much air volume is in the house. They'll take the square footage of the house and say this is the air volume. This is what you need. If you think about it, you're heating this room now. Most people don't think you got to do something with the cold air that, that you're uh, working on uh, in this room. So if you just keep pumping hot air into the room, you're going to get so much air into the room, you need to draw it out some, some way. So we have central return, the return air is individual for, for, uh, for the rooms. The other thing that most of it gets uh, forgotten about is the customer uh, part of the heating and cooling system. Your heating cooling system is only going to be as good as the care you give it. Um, if you have a dirty filter, for example, a lot of the furnaces we install today in the new home have an emergency shutoff in it, where if the filter gets clogged, the furnace shuts down, it doesn't protect itself. So you have to maintain a clean air filter, um, keep air. air uh, Turn air grills open, uncovered, things like that that you, that you uh, need to do. Um, a small <coughs> furnace is a detriment to a house. If you just go and buy the cheapest furnace you can get for that house, the smallest BTU and everything else, you're never going to heat and cool that house properly. So it has to be designed, has to be sized properly to fit, to fit your needs. Uh, an oversized furnace is a waste of heat. Waste of money, waste of BTUs, which is what, what they use for uh, determining how much airflow you're getting through the system. So each house is going to be a little bit different. All depends on layout too. You can have a huge ranch, a long ranch. You can maybe do a zone system in or a dual system in. It's all going to depend individually on each one. Um, again, the only thing that uh, people think about today is a uh, furnace system working, they, they call it repair. We got to try to design houses where you're not going to have a problem that you So that's, that's our goal. Thank you. As we go through the design process that Brad and Alexander both talked about the fact that a lot of decisions you're going to make. The more of those decisions you make up front, the better it's going to be for everybody. Uh, heard that terms maybe change orders, allowances, uh, those are things that, that you, know, you get a little budget you're trying to work with at the beginning and then you're going to pick your lights and your landscaping, your plumbing, and your flooring and cabinets and all those different things. So Steve Craver's going to talk with us a little bit about, where you go? Uh, going to talk a little bit about one of the change orders and allowances and how those affect the process. I brought a hand up, so I'm going to walk around here and kind of hand it out to you as I start to talk. Uh, again, my name is Steve Craver. I'm with Craver Donaldson Homes. My partner's right over there, Mark Donaldson. He's waving his hand right now. 
So when we go into contract, you get three documents, um, three important documents. That would be your plans, the contract, obviously, and the specifications. At Fairway Balance at Home, we have uh, an 18 page specification sheet that tries to outline everything within your house so that we can minimize the uh, change orders. Um, so we can minimize the change orders needed. But as it always goes, you're out of the Actually, give me one question. Thank you. Thank you. So um, a, cha a change order is obviously a document that details the changes, the associated costs, the effects it might have on the schedule. And then we have the signatures of the buyer and the builder on that. Um, in some cases where the change order may require structural changes, we'll include an architectural plan along with that. Um, things to consider when, you, when we initiate a change are obviously the cost, the time, how it affects the schedule, the subcontractors needed to make that happen, um, if you have a big change, it may require additional permitting, and then any deconstruction. If you make a decision later on that you want something changed uh, that's already been covered up, obviously you have to go back in and tear something up, make it, make it what you want. So that's why it's very important, like when you're working with the architects, when you're working with our designers, to try and figure everything out right away. It doesn't always happen like that, and we're more than happy to make your house however you want it, just know that, uh, that uh, it will require a change order and some cost. Um, so beyond the change order, there's allowances. Some items within your contract will just be allowances. Common those are appliances, cabinets, lighting fixtures, plumbing fixtures, stuff like that. It's important when we start talking that we get a good idea of what kind of things you're thinking about. For example, I built a house a couple years ago and the client had $100,000 in appliances. <coughs> So if I had put a $5,000 appliance budget in the contract, he obviously would have blown that pretty, pretty bad. So it was important that we had that conversation where I was aware of the level of appliances he wanted. And so that's what we put in the budget, in the allowance when we got together. Uh, on, the other on the flip side of that, I just built a house where we picked out a nice Kenmore set of appliances. It was $2,000. We had a $2,000 allowance in the budget and it worked, it worked perfectly. So there's, Big example, big difference there, but uh, that's why it's important that we have that conversation up front. Um, back to the change order. I also had a, a, you know, when you make some changes, sometimes there's some credits. For example, um, I recently had a contract where we were putting a pool house in. Well, but later on, the guy decided he didn't want the pool house. Well, the pool house was a $130,000 option that he had on there. Well, he decided he didn't want it. So he got $130,000 credit. Now granted, he spent that $130,000 elsewhere, so it ended up being a wash, but that's just an example of, let's figure out what you want, whether you know right away or whether you figure it out later. Um, we can get it right, we can get, we get you what you want, but it usually is gonna take place on a change order. Um, just change order the allowances. architecture at Evans Farm, and some of them are really trendy. Uh, Rick Tossi is with Bob Webb Homes, and he's going to talk to you about those two things. So timeless interior design versus current design trends is the ultimate catch-22 for many people who are considering building a custom home. You want a home that looks current and modern now, and at the same time, you don't want to look have it look outdated in three, five, even 10 years. But you also want a home that isn't a clone for all the other homes you've seen. You don't want to be bored with the design and the atmosphere of your home. You want it to feel practical, efficient, welcoming, and unique to your style. Some people fear building a trendy design that they will love for a couple of years, but then regret building it after a few more years, or choose a home that is great for resale value five years from now, but is bland and boring. 
Instead of sacrificing, there is a way to have both when you build with a reputable builder. There is a way to create the right balance. Three things to consider when building a custom home. Number one, think timeless for your fixed and attached elements, and think trendy for accessories and accents. The flow and the architectural design of your home creates a timeless impression. The wall placement, the amount of natural light, the ceiling height, and the quality trim play a big part in your timeless design. You want to choose an experienced builder that has seen trends come and go and can appreciate and anticipate a design that will last 20, 30, even 40 years down the road. Number two, keep things neutral. More costly items like flooring, cabinets, high-end high furniture, or anything you plan to keep for 10 years or more should be neutral. These items can be expensive to replace. You can create a trendy feel by accenting these features with furniture and smaller decorations. Number three, pick features you like regardless of trends. Choose features that make you happy. You want to create a beautiful home that makes you happy. If you always liked a particular style or design feature, go for it. You're less likely to get tired of a feature if you've always gravitated towards it in the past. Lean towards the side of timeless design. Some questions you may want to ask yourself. Is it practical and beautiful? Trendy pieces may fit this description, but they sometimes are either made hastily or in a tag-along pattern. A piece that functions well is made well, and is aesthetically present wins the crown for the timeless design. Are you going to use it? What purpose does a particular room or feature of a home serve? How often are you going to use it? Daily? Weekly? Monthly? Do you love it? When it comes down to it, follow your instincts. Some things flow in and out of style, but if it appeals to you immediately and you come back to it time and time again, then it is timeless to you. Your appreciation of it keeps it relevant. Keep your home functional. A functional plan and layout will create a timeless design. For example, the open plan was a trend that is now moving into a timeless design because of its practicality. How many people here today uh, attended the parade of homes this year? Okay, so you may have seen our Bob Webb's messy kitchen. With Thanksgiving coming up next week, you can keep up front the gorgeous kitchen island you've always longed for, and in the back, a separate kitchen pantry, messy kitchen, where you keep the coffee maker, the blender, the mixer, do all your kitchen prep and make all the mess you want. Just shut the door and no one else has to see the mess. Our parade house also featured a family foyer. Your family comes home, they need boots, backpacks, carpets, and the ready. The family foyer keeps it all in check with cubbies and charging stations customized for your busy schedule. You want to come home to an organized home and a family foyer does just that. So the messy kitchen and family foyer are two trends that could possibly become timeless designs because of their practicality. In closing, our brand new model home at the Ravines of McCann and Chase is a timeless design and it's also current trendworthy. We invite you to visit us there. It's in Lewis Center. Thank you. So developing a new project like this, uh, we spend a lot of time talking to Realtors and doing focus groups with prospective buyers, and also we spent time talking to builders. And one of the first builders we talked with is, is our next speaker. Uh, he's got a passion for small uh, and loves the idea of what we're doing here in terms of new urbanism, and is well well read on this subject. And uh, I, I uh, invite Mark Ronsdorf with Compass Homes to come up and talk about that. So as Ray said, my name is Mark Brunsworth, I have Compass Homes, and I'm going to ask a question to start. How many of you know what new urbanism or traditional neighborhood development really is? <laughs> All right, here we go. So about 25, 30 years ago, there was a movement with developers to rethink development. Development changed between <coughs> World War I and World War 
or two from what we see in Old Worthington, Old Westerville, downtown Bexley, Clintonville, to what you see today. And one of the biggest things was they started really separating uses. So you have these pods of houses and offices and shopping and the places we gather, you know, the post office or the schools or what have you. And if you go to old towns, you know, if you go to old downtown Worthington, the high school is walking distance from the shopping and there's offices and housing, and it's all mixed together. And basically these four uses. And a new, ur new urbanism community or traditional neighborhood development is the idea that we can combine those uses back and create a much, a much friendlier, a much more congruent sense of place. And Columbus has not really seen one ever developed. There's been little parts and pieces in New Albany and some other places that have happened. Uh, certainly German Village and places like that, but were developed you know, over 100 years ago. Um, and so it's really the blend of these four places that pretty much everybody needs. They need to buy stuff grocery shopping, put gas in their car, and sort of thing. They need to work, they live, and they gather. And they gather and can be anything from like the barn that's being designed, the school site, to quite frankly the sidewalk, the dining. And in a new urbanism community, the houses are typically much closer. The garages are typically on the rear, which you'll see most of this community like there are certainly some lots that are not. Um, and those tight lots, the idea is that they're all within a quarter to half So when you, when you live in a community like this, it's much more about the streetscape than your individual house. You're not on this one acre lot and you're looking at your house, you're looking down the street and seeing the entire streetscape. And it's more about how the street, how you interact with the street. And inside the house, it's still all about you. It's still all the things you want. Um, and a lot of people ask, how do you get privacy in your community? Well, you do it by the design of the house. And a lot of these houses will be C-shaped design, which means that there'll be a front, and then there'll be a narrow section, and then there'll be the back, which is the garage, which creates a private like, courtyard. And that can be your yard, your patio, your outdoor living. Uh, again, part of the reason that the architects want all the houses to work together is because if you look at a newer type house plan alone, it looks like a very narrow house. When you look at a street scheme, in fact, the book has some great it all started to work together. So uh, there are great examples of it if you want to go on the web and look at uh, around the country or even if you're in these places. Um, one of the, the most famous is Seaside in Florida, which is certainly a resort community, but if you saw the Truman Show, that's where they filmed that. Um, Kentlands, which is K-E-N-T lands, Kentlands, in Washington, D.C., Gatorsburg, Maryland, is another great example. If you Google images for these places, Haven, which is currently active, probably about half built out, is in uh, south of Nashville in Franklin, Tennessee. Celebration, which if you go to Disney, is just outside of Walt Disney World, uh, off 192. Uh, well worth driving in, parking, walking around, seeing what it's all about. Uh, there's a place in Louisville, which is a little closer, called the Morgan Commons. And if you're in Denver, there's a place called Stapleton, which used to be the airport, which they re rebuilt over the last Those are the types of fields that this community is going for. And I encourage all of you to go to a little survey and look at those places and say, gee, it looks like a place I'd like to live or not. If it doesn't, then maybe this isn't for you. Um, when you build a house in a new urban community, there's going to be different challenges. The architecture restrictions are going to be high. There's going to be uh, a lot of detail required. And almost all the houses will have large front porches. The good thing is, because the house is narrower, when you're building 30 feet in front of the house instead of 80 feet in front of your house, that's going to help keep those costs in check. Uh, there's going to be additional costs, additional hauling costs, and things like that. But there's also going to be savings in sod and landscape. The requirements would be very heavy landscape in front, but again, these are narrow lots, so it doesn't take much. You know, 10 feet, about 40 feet of landscape to, to really make it beautiful. Um, there are going to be a a number of different builders in here that build in different ways. And it's really important to understand that there's going to be builders that are going to build a blank sheet of paper, um, whatever you want, and, and uh, from the ground up, absolutely use 
builders that are building spec homes or plans that are already predefined will probably be at the lower end of the price spectrum because they've got more cost control in those kind of things. It doesn't mean the houses are less quality or less value or less nice, it just means they're going to be on the lower spectrum of that. I mean, generally, when you do a true custom home, the costs go up. Um, and you will start to see this community develop as the streets develop. Because what's going to happen is they're going to, the, the, the idea is to try to build a street at a time of 8, 10, 12 houses on each side of the road. It's going to be really good to be able to do it. And it's going to be fabulous.
And that is, as you go through pages 29 to 45, it has everything regarding landscaping. And you'd be amazed, you wouldn't think that in a new subdivision you'd be allowed to do these things, but we want you to collect rainwater and, and use it. Um, you are allowed to do uh, uh, solar panels as long as they're not visible from the street. Um, there's a lot of things that, there's actually 17 different items here uh, that you can go through and, and learn, you know, answer a lot of questions, but also kind of guide you in the right direction so that you're not coming in with construction documents that won't fit in this neighborhood. And so you want to go through all these, you get a lot of questions answered, and then, as Sandra mentioned, your initial design, go ahead and turn those in and, and make sure you're on the right track before you have to make major changes uh, in your design. That's it. generously agreed to donate as a prize to whoever comes up with the exact size of this room uh, a free week's supply of Evans Farm water. <laughs> <laughs> I have my guess, so you can all uh, guess on that too. I think part of the mission statement of Evans Farm is to be a sustainable community. And in that effort, I think solar panels can fit very nicely uh, in this community and they've been encouraged by Ray and the developers, and we'll try to use them as much as we can. Um, some great things have happened. The last five years, solar panels have dropped 80% of the cost of solar panels. Um, <clears throat> they have like a 30-year life expectancy. You can produce all the electricity you want for your home. You can go for just half of the electricity. And whatever the cost is, in a typical, like a nine kilowatt system, which would power most people's homes completely, is going to be around in the $20,000, $25,000 range. You get a 30% federal tax credit right off the top. So that brings it down into the $20,000 range. And I know we have some bankers here. If you look at a $400,000 mortgage versus a $420,000 mortgage, what's the difference on a 30-year fixed payment per month? And you compare that and you say, oh, well, it's more a month. What is your savings on electricity? So look at that right up front. It's, I, the payback is pretty quick on these things. So, uh, and then orientation, if that's south, the exit sign is red, so I'll say that is south. Ideally, your roof would face south with about a 25 to 30 degree pitch on it. Now that's ideal, and we used to think, oh, that's, it's just gotta be south facing, but it could be east or west facing also and still get plenty of sun. Um, people say, well, we don't have enough sun in Ohio. You, we get about 4.2 solar hours per day in Ohio. Miami gets five. So we get plenty of sun here in Ohio. I happen to be uh, in Europe uh, with my son who was studying abroad uh, a couple years ago. And you go through Germany and, and Luxembourg, all these houses, even modest homes have solar panels, even if they're small arrays, but they have PVs on their roof. I think it's, uh, I say sometimes Columbus is a white bread mashed potatoes town that we're not embracing innovation, and we're not cutting edge, but they are becoming accepted. They're much more mainstream than they used to be. And I think we should all uh, consider that within the restrictions and confines of the design guidelines so they're not, you're not facing a street. Um, we will be, every, every home that has solar in here will be uh, grid tied. You can be on, off the grid where you have to have batteries, or a generator firing when you don't have electricity, but we'll all be tied to ADP. And what happens is when you're on a nice summer day, when your, your PV panels are creating a lot of juice, more than you need to cool your house, 
you can feed this power back to AEP, and they will give you a credit. They're not going to give you a check at the end of each month or anything, but they will reduce your electric bill, and you'll see that. You'll see that every year. Uh, let's see. That's about it, I guess. Yeah, for now. Cost, everyone says, well, how much does it cost to build a house? Is it $150 a square foot? I mean, how does that all work? Uh, and of course, every house is different, as you've heard uh, through this whole process. Uh, Lisa Albanese is with Three Pillars. She's going to talk about some of the ways to save money as you're going through the design process. So as Ray said, I'm Lisa
and to pre-plan and talk about it. So the fact that these loans are designed to allow you to be flexible, that you can add something in and not use it all, it's not a guarantee that you have to spend it there, but if it's in place for you, you've given yourself a little bit of room because $10,000 hard cash is a much more difficult conversation to have it's, if it's unexpected than 10,000 that's there and sitting in that loan for you waiting and then all of a sudden if you don't need it it can come back to you it can go back to your principal you can decide you get to determine how that money is applied but if you have it pre-planned for it in the beginning then it's a little bit of a harder conversation another thing that's important besides preparing through really due diligence of the standard features and talking through the, the options and understanding um, the, the things that you can see in writing and then planning for those uh, um, upgrades or extras is getting the, the ability to be comfortable with some unknowns. So if preparation is what, what you want to focus on and having a disciplined budget. Um, earlier, our architect conversation was, I love it when people come in with an idea. The hardest ones are the ones that say, I don't know. I would say that's the same thing that's true for builders and for sales managers too. When, when you ask the question, well, what's the budget? And somebody says, I don't know. Sometimes that's an evasive question to sort of say, hey, let's try and not lay all our cards on the table right now until we start to feel each other out. But sometimes the person on the other side of the table really doesn't know. And if you don't know what a budget is and you're not starting out with one to begin with, you will have a bumpier experience than the homeowner that sets a budget. Setting a budget and going past it a little bit, or setting a budget and coming under it, those are way more comfortable experiences than not setting a budget. Whether or not you wanna convey how much of the slush fund you intend to do over the course of time with, with upgraded lights or appliances to the builder, that's it, not necessarily something you have to commit all of that up front, but it is something that you wanna get into your budget. And again, cash flow budget versus borrowed budget, time of when things are due. Tie back to the change order policy. Will I be expected to pay for this up front if it's not in the mortgage? Will I be able to pay for it at the end when the home is finished? Can I make progress payments to things that aren't financed? So having some conversations about how the money works with the process and then planning for a little extra beyond what you think you're gonna need so that you can have the freedom to get into the home and have something that you maybe didn't know you wanted on the start but that it becomes something really important to you. You don't want to be so inflexible in your budget that you miss the forest through the trees. So if you're spending the, home, the time to develop a plan and spending the money that you're spending to build this home, you don't want to miss the thing that makes the house special or makes you walk in the door and love it because at the finish <coughs> line, you're just a little tight on money when it comes to things like getting the kitchen right or getting that everyday living space. So you want to give yourself the freedom to start from a budget, but within that budget to have some flex dollars that you haven't earmarked for every last iota. So sometimes I have the no budget people, and sometimes I have the I need to know everything down to the penny people. And both sides of those equations, um, it's good to bring to the middle ground and say have a budget, but have some flexibility within the budget. Um, as, as far as going through the process of figuring out dollars and cents finance versus not, you're gonna hear more about construction loans and, and have some opportunities with um, Richmond Bank. But I would also tell people that there are some ways to save money by thinking about certain things that you can possibly leverage over the course of the bill. For example, appliances. In, in our market today, very few of our homeowners are really financing all of their appliances in a construction loan. Pillar operates predominantly off of a, a custom build, construction firm kind of lending situation. Um, very few people are really loading a lot of dollars into that because if you go to the vendors that are offering something like appliances, they oftentimes have 12 months savings cash. You pay for them with no interest over the course of the build. You select them out, you get the specs to your appliance or to your cabinet vendor. You know what you're going to be doing, but you may not actually have to have them fully purchased until pretty late into the finish line process, you don't necessarily have to put them in on a 30 year fixed and pay for those with interest over 30 years. So if you can talk about cash flow for payment of some things that may not need to be financed, but also um, could be planned for over the course of that whole bill, those are places where you might have some cost savings opportunities. Um, one other um, approach that sometimes comes up is figuring out how to plan for the now versus the a lot of homeowners come in and if they're building a custom home, they want it all. If they were looking at existing, they might sacrifice a little. Ah, it's got about 80, 90% of what I want. But when they come into a new build, by the nature of custom and the fact that they can go to the 
so if they think I have to get everything I want, if I'm not going to get everything I want, I, I don't want to move forward with it. And I think that you have to give yourself, in light of the fact that everybody has a budget, you have to give yourself some room to say, get the fundamentals, the big things, the things you cannot change later into the equation. Don't miss those fundamental areas like kitchens, good design, ceiling heights, the things that you can never go back and really fix very easily on your own. And then plan for it, give yourself permission to grow into the house on things that can be done for the future. Roughing in finish or lower levels so that you can prepare for finishing. Um, planning for things, you know, sometimes people say, oh gosh, barn doors, I love the barn doors, we do them, we see them all the time, and sometimes that makes the list right out of the gate. But if at the end of the day you're down to your, your last few thousand dollars of thinking about where things go, the barn door is a piece you can definitely add later. If you have the conversation with your builder and the architect and you're planning to take the barn door, but you provide it later or do it later, it helps you free up the upfront dollars and do some things over time or into the future of the house, as opposed to feeling like it's an all or nothing experience. Um, those are my highlights for um, some cost savings ideas. Most every builder that you're going to work with is going to be able to give you some good ideas about which things really you should bring into the, the forefront of the conversation and which things are maybe lifestyle buckets or can become lifestyle buckets. You're going to hear from my good friend AJ. And he's going to talk to you about some, some of the categories that can be super important, but they can quickly go into lifestyle budgets. So when you're thinking about building for yourself, Build the home that you love, you heard that earlier today, but also build the home that's going to be insulated for your future resale value so that if and when the time comes that you have to put the house on the market, that it hasn't become so unique or so to you that you missed the opportunity to, to sell um, speedily and, and actually make money on the sale of your home. So what is a lifestyle bucket? We talk about this at Three Pillar all the time. If you have a homeowner that wants it their way, you really specialize in but a lifestyle bucket might be $30,000 worth of sound equipment in a neighborhood that doesn't support that. You know, it's great to have a smart home, it's great to have some of the key technologies, but some of the overkill, you can do those as long as you understand that's just out of your pocket because you want it, not necessarily because the mass market will pay for that. So finding where those things matter, and there's no right or wrong. At the end of the day, that's the beauty of custom, is to get what you want and what you value but recognize that some things have greater return on your investment than others. My name is AJ McPherson. I'm representing PD Builders tonight. And they do a smart thing. They bring in a professional to handle the topic. Because a lot of what I do, you will probably want to do the same thing. Okay? Uh, my field is the evaporator of slush funds. All right? <laughs> because you get into the technology side of things and it can go like that. And the scary part about that is you have to really be careful where you allocate your funds, all right? Now, we've probably all heard the term smart home in here before. I've been hearing the term smart home since the turn of the century. The smart home's coming, the smart home's coming, the smart home's coming. Well, it was terrible before. It wasn't very good. I prefer the term connected home because that goes a long way to describing what we're all doing with the internet. If you think about it, <clears throat> And this is kind of scary. The internet's still an infant. When you think about other technologies that came through, like like HVAC, um, like, like like when solar started, think about the car, think about the phone. The internet is still in its infancy, so we don't really know where this is going to go. We don't know how robust this is going to be. All I can promise you is change. Okay. 
So how do we best prepare for that? Well, it's really interesting right now, content is, there's a war for content right now, going on between companies like Comcast, AT&T, <coughs> Google, Microsoft, Apple, and how it's going to be delivered to the house. We are already getting close to 25 to 30% more content just in the last five years over the internet, all right? That's why you see these huge mergers and these huge purchases coming down the line. So how do we deliver that in our homes most effectively? And the term for that you've probably all heard before too, or maybe you haven't, I don't know, I know the builders are probably nauseated by it. But the term is structured wiring. And that has changed a lot. People say, I get everything over Wi-Fi, I get everything wirelessly. Well, that's great. But odds are pretty good that you're a growing family or an existing family. And when you talk about all the devices, every person has 2.5 wireless devices, okay? You're gonna end up with somewhere between 15 and 20 wireless devices in your house. Well, as you guys all know, living here in central Ohio, this area is a great example. You can get around this area very easily, except between about 4 and 6 p.m. That's your house every single day with all those wireless devices fighting for what we call bandwidth. Right? So when I come in, the first thing I do is get a feel for who I'm dealing with and say, we're going to run something called Ethernet or network wiring. Now, we're thinking, well, that must be a little bit outdated. That was for the desktop computer that sat on the floor with a loud fan and a big clunky monitor on the desk. I use an iPad now. I use a laptop now. Well, all these with a lot of devices in your house, that's true. You are going to still use these things, but you're going to control a lot of hardwired devices with your wireless. We run most of our network wiring these days for network Blu-ray players, streaming media players, smart TVs, all these different items that are delivering the content into your home. That's, that's one half of what we do. So we get a real good feel for how you're going to live in your house. Because I have right now, I, I, was, I was just over here fucks around with my software, I've got a decent amount, I have a, a, about a 15 to 18% of my customers aren't even doing uh, cable or satellite TV. They're simply streaming all of their content. And with all of them, we have hardwired all the devices that are gonna provide this for them. Because it is still the smartest, most efficient way to do these things. The browsers they put in these wireless devices like your Apple TVs, and especially your smart TVs. You can't buy a TV these days that isn't quote unquote smart, okay? And nothing will make you feel dumber than standing in front of your TV waiting for, uh, I don't know, what's the one that my wife watches? couple in Lincoln, Texas. Fixer up. Okay, everyone wants to watch the fixer up or when Ben watches because they've set aside this time to watch. So we hardwire all these smart TVs and everything so they run a lot quicker and more effectively. Because a big part of the connected home is the entertainment portion of it. Okay? That that has a lot to do with, with what I do. So hardwiring these things and putting them into your budget ahead of time so you don't have to have change orders later. So that you know what the costs are going to be. Uh, Cecil made a comment earlier I really like that no one thinks about HVAC calls that would work. Okay? It's right on the money. But if you want to upset an American family these days, make it so they're in Okay? <laughs> Everyone's giggling, right? Because that 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 is that is a big part of handling these things and building the infrastructure in place so that everyone's wireless devices can work because their hardwired devices are gobbling up that bandwidth. We do networks for people. And what's funny about that is I didn't get in the business to do wireless networks. That, that, and, and, and I was a security system dealer. But everybody's networks were so bad. And then when we started doing entertainment items, I would spend half the day fixing their shoddy network to get my stuff to work. Okay? And then all of, a lot of the things I do, streaming music services, home theaters, distributed audio, um, would not work properly because the network was so bad. So we got into the network business. Now, the other side of what I do and the other side of the connected home uh, is efficiency, which we've heard a lot about today, um, and, and uh, security. So you, uh, Time Warner is a perfect example of this. Time Warner, one of the best companies out there known for their customer service, right? <laughs> That's such a cheap, easy line. They're already out of the security business, okay? That didn't last very long, because they did not do a very good and a very efficient job of it. It was a lot of free advertising for me, and we are currently replacing a decent amount. You don't want the, the, the company that can't make your internet or your TV work being charged to keep your home safe. Okay, let someone like me take care of that. But the big pitch these days, you can't get through 
uh, any sporting event when you're sitting there watching it without hearing about how you can connect to your home uh, remotely. Now, how many people currently have a security system that they can look with their phone out and control right now? Okay, so that's good. So, so maybe 10% of you. That's growing uh, at, at an exponential rate because a lot of people, when I sit down with them when they're building their house, I ask them, did you have a security system? Yeah, we did. The next question I ask is, did you use it? And even when we're talking about entertainment systems like distributed audio, did you have speakers around the house? Yeah, I did. Did you use it? The answer two thirds of the time is no, I didn't use it. Why? Because I, I, I was afraid of it. Or, or uh, I didn't understand how to use it. It was too big of a hassle to use it. That is so true. And we design systems to avoid that problem. Because the last thing any of the builders want here, and the last thing that, that, that I want are service calls. Or people that don't use the devices, and people that feel like they wasted their budget and their money on this sort of thing. So how many of you have actually seen the interface for like a smart home type security? Uh, okay, let me show that to you real quick. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see what it looks like so you don't have to be afraid of it. There's stuff works in here, right? <laughs> okay. So here you go. I use a platform called Alarm.com. I'm not saying you have to. It's just simply the best one out there. And uh, I know you're all probably wondering. It does interface with Alexa. You want to know what the Amazon Echo is? There's a go. There's a reason that the new dot came out this fall that everybody can have it in their stocking for this uh, Christmas. So I can go in and talk to my house and have it do things. But this right here is actually a representation of what you would see on your phone through alarm.com to be able to control it. This is a Smith house. They were generous enough to donate this. But you can see that you can tell that your system is disarmed, that you can adjust the thermostats. Okay, so this speaks to the efficiency thing that we were talking about earlier. If there's a problem with your system, some carriers will actually interface with alarm.com to notify when there's an actual problem. Because like you said, a lot of them shut down now if the air filters don't get changed and you can actually get notifi notifications on here so it doesn't get, so it doesn't hopefully get that far. You can tell if your garage doors open or closed. You can tell if doors are locked. We had talked earlier a little bit about lighting. Guys like me don't come in and mess with the pretty lights you spend days and weeks stressing over and picking out. We just change out the switches to make those lights more efficient. And that's an example here, <coughs> being able to turn lights off remotely. My lights come on at dusk, they go off at dawn, and never have to mess with them because I'm a busy dad, father of two, I forget to do things every day, but my house takes care of me that way. So two parts of the connected home that I really, that I, that I wanted to drive home more than anything were the entertainment aspect of it. We use Sonos for our distributed audio, you may or may not have heard that term before. Uh, and then we use the smart, connected, interactive portion of it with the alarm.com. All these things are designed to be fun and designed to save you money, but they will do the exact opposite if you don't use and employ your builder, see who that professional is, and put a little bit of money into your budget ahead of time to have these things. But if I was gonna stress everything, get some network wiring in your house so that your devices will be connected over hard wire, don't wait till the end of things to be like, oh my God, my Wi-Fi doesn't work. You can do things up front very uh, efficiently to make sure that your experience in your new home you spent all this time is an enjoyable one and you don't have headaches or nightmares or any, anything along those lines. Any quick questions? Uh, I'll obviously be here till the end. Feel free to come up and ask. Uh, and I want to thank P&D and, and Ray for having me today. Thanks. Thank you. Construction timeline is, is one that is uh, fascinating and it's different. We talked about all every builder kind of does things differently, but there are certain things that have to go in the right order. And, and really good builders is one of the things that they're good at is making sure that they get things timed properly so that there's not a lot of dead time between the you know, electricians and plumbers and all those people going in and out. So Pat Schultz, uh, is that you next? Am I doing this right? Yeah, so the phone. Pat's going to talk to you about the uh, construction, the actual timeline.
like a long time from now, but it really isn't. By the time you go through the design phase, get your plan ready, and you start down the road of the lender, somewhere <coughs> you go through that phase and go through the selection process of your interior next year selection. Time will fly. It's amazing how fast time goes when we're trying to put every, all the details together uh, on the house. Um, there's always uh, three questions that are common to every person I've ever met with looking to build a house or a client that I built for. And that's what's the cost per square foot and that usually gets asked right up front. Being at Evans Farm, every house is going to be different. It's designed to be a custom design subdivision. We're uh, not allowed to build the same house somewhat from house to house, from, from lot to lot, obviously. Um, one of the other questions I always get asked further on down is, what's your time frame? Every house is different, but every builder should be able to give you some kind of scope as to say, okay, this square footage house should take me about this long to build. Um, going through with the construction loan, which will all go through unless you're paying cash for the house, we're going to be set up on draws, and typically, I, uh, with my lenders, I'll do a five draw process. My goal as a builder, and I don't usually hit this very often, but my goal is every month I'm going to be going for a draw, which then translates into about a time, about a five month time frame. Obviously, the bigger the house we build, the longer it's going to take us to do that, and the five months doesn't play into it. But the weather affects it. Um, right now, we're all, uh, all the builders are fighting with labor shortages and all of our suppliers and subcontractors. Um, so you know, we've got to be very tight on our schedule.
probably the most important part of all this is how do I pay for it? Uh, and one of the first uh, tenants in the downtown of Evans Farm uh, will be Ridgewood Bank. So Scott Ross is going to talk a little bit about the construction loans and all the options that are out there for paying for the, the building that you're on. Thanks, Ray. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, gosh, I thought I had to follow our sentence and everybody talk. So as Ray said, we are going to work with, uh, with everybody building and with the builders. We'll try to make this as a seamless process as we can for you. Um, some of you may require a lot of money, some of you may not. Uh, most of you hopefully will require a mortgage, which is not the reason for me to be up here. But I'm going to go through uh, kind of just the, the key points of assuming you do need a lot of money all the way through your permanent loan and how it's kind of structured. So you're going to get with one of these builders after you've picked out a lot of gray, uh, and you're going to initiate an application for the financing on that lot, which is going to require 10% down from you. Um, after that, about 10 to 14 days after application, we're going to close you on the lot, and you will begin making interest-only payments on that lot until you go into a contract, which is, could be 90 days or 90 days <coughs> once you start working with them. And then you are going to initiate another application with me, and that is for your construction and permanent loan. Uh, the construction loans, they've indicated some of these people could probably be on my payroll, um, is, is initiated in draws. So you will close on your construction loan, and about 90 days later, uh, they will start building. And each time they get to a certain phase, which typically four to six uh, draw periods, uh, we'll go out, we'll make sure the work's done to your, to your liking, and we'll issue another draw. Um, once all that's taken place, at closing, we're going to combine the lot loan with the construction loan, if you have the lot loan, and you're going to close on your work. Actually, you do a already closed on your construction loan, so you're going to go a little tight up here. At the completion of each your occupancy permit, the construction loan is going to convert into your permanent mortgage. Um, a couple of things that we do to kind of protect you through this process, because it's going to be anywhere from six months to a year, is once you close on that construction loan, you can lock your rate in, and that's the loan, the rate that you're going to have when you close on your permanent mortgage, which we call the end loan. So let's say that's 3.875, and that's what it'll be next year. I can uh, guess that I'm looking up here right now. But at any rate, that rate, that rate is locked, and you're protected from any market legislation. So that's kind of the bullet points from a lot loan to the construction loan to the permanent loan. Um, if you go into a jumbo, we do have um, what they call piggyback loans. So your first loan, your primary loan is going to be your conventional loan. Then you're going to have a second loan up to 80 percent. And on those jumbo loans, we need to cut it down to at least uh, 20 percent. Um, so we've got it covered from the conventional loans to the jumbo loans and not loans. And I'll be around for any questions afterwards. I don't have a lot of new stuff to talk about. I wish I'd talk to this guy before I got my smart TV about a month ago. <laughs> because I'm now using Netflix, and uh, my son's telling my internet sucks. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Please stick around and talk to these folks if you have any questions. And, and one more round of applause, please, for these folks.